With the legendary P-51 Mustang, there are plenty of stories that have been told time and time again, but there is one perhaps that has been largely forgotten and is without a doubt one of the most incredible. This is the story of Medal of Honor winner Louis J. Sabille. Louis joined the U.S. Army Air Force shortly after Pearl Harbor and after training was sent to England to join the fight, but not originally as a fighter pilot. He would actually first serve in a far more dangerous role. This would be as a bomber pilot in the 322nd Bomb Group flying a B-26 Marauder by the name of Mild and Bitter. Now, in the wake of the incredible aircraft like the B-17, B-24, and B-25, the role of the B-26 in World War II has often been overlooked. But it was, in many respects, more dangerous than any of the others, especially at the time when Sabeel was deployed in 1943. In this role, the aircraft primarily served as a low-altitude bomber, flying nimbly and quickly at treetop level, dropping bombs with delayed fuses and strafing targets with an arsenal of machine guns. This combat forced her pilots to learn to fly it like a fighter at many times, and also exposed them to intense German flak, which dealt heavy losses to nearly all of the early units. To put into perspective just how dangerous this role was, during the second mission of his unit, Sabeel happened to be sitting out of the assignment, and in this raid, ten bombers proceeded across the channel to strike their target. None of them would return. But miraculously, despite the high risk, Sabeel would survive the war, flying 68 combat missions in the B-26 over Europe, and his marauder, Mild and Bitter, would be the first B-26 of the war to complete 100 successful combat missions. This success would make him one of the only early marauder pilots that was not lost in these dangerous combat missions. His experience in this time flying low-level ground attack sorties would foreshadow the role that he would be assigned to next. After World War II ended in just a few years, a new conflict would start, but this time in Korea. When this new battle broke out in 1950, pilots were needed to support the United Nations troops on the ground. And who would they call? Skilled pilots for low-level support, like that of Louis Sabeel. But now, Sabeel was not flying in the B-26 any longer, as it was obviously obsolete. Instead, after World War II had come to an end, he had been assigned to teach pilots to fly in the advanced U.S. Air Force fighters like the P-51 Mustang. The Mustang saw a great amount of action over Europe in the Second World War as a long-range escort primarily, and was built as a dogfighter. But now, in Korea, with the advanced jet fighters like the F-80 and MiG-15, the Mustang has now been redirected to a support role, being loaded with bombs and rockets to hit pinpoint targets in the tough terrain of this new battlefield. Now, in 1950, after training young aviators in the new aircraft and becoming a master of the fighter, he was skilled and ready to see action and at this time was likely the most experienced ground attack pilot fighting in the war over Korea. He was obviously an ideal choice to lead a new Mustang squadron in Korea, but unfortunately things would not go as planned. After arriving to Korea just a month after the war officially started, Sabeel's unit, the 67th Fighter Bomber Squadron, would be in the thick of it. On August 1st, they officially entered the war and began flying support for the soldiers on the ground. After a couple of missions, it became clear that the fighting would be intense. On August 5th, just a few days into their assignment, an American recon plane was patrolling over the Naktong River when a North Korean convoy was spotted headed through a small village right at the U.S. 8th Army troops. Immediately, their position was radioed in and an attack was ordered. Three Mustangs from Sabeel's unit were ordered to take off and strike. Sabeel and two other pilots started their engines and got rolling. The P-51s, which were technically referred to as F-51s during this time, were armed with six rockets and two 500-pound bombs, one under each wing. Sabeel would be the leader for this attack, with one fighter on each wing. Shortly after arriving in the target area, the pilots spotted the convoy, North Korean armored vehicles crossing the river to attack friendly positions. Sabeel went in first and began a medium-angle dive bombing run, planning to release both of his bombs in the first attack. 
As he came down, he positioned the targets below him and pressed the button to release his payload. But something went wrong. Only one of his two bombs dropped and left a 500 pound imbalance underneath one wing. This made it very difficult to fly the plane. Sabil immediately had to turn back around and begin another run on the targets to release his second bomb. But as he began this attack, North Korean anti-aircraft fire fixed his Mustang in their sights and scored a direct hit. His aircraft quickly began to smoke heavily and was leaking coolant fluid. After seeing the hit and spotting the damage, one of his wingmen, Captain Martin Johnson, radioed to the leader, asking if he was okay. Louis Sabil replied back, saying that he was hit badly and injured himself, likely fatally. Johnson suggested that Sabil turn for home and attempt to make an emergency landing at a U.S. airstrip a short distance away. But the response that came back from their leader declined this suggestion and would be the last known words from the American hero. He radioed back, No, I'll never make it. I'm going back to get the bastard. In that moment, Louis Sabil's Mustang turned for one final attack, right at the North Korean vehicles that had just hit his aircraft. As he roared right at the vehicles below him, he released all of his ordnance and unloaded with his six 50 caliber machine guns, unleashing a storm of fire onto the convoy. And then, as one last action, while his plane took even more damage, Major Louis Sabil dove his aircraft directly into the enemy vehicles, destroying a large group of North Korean troops and killing himself. His two wingmen made it back to base, and shortly after the incident, the commanding officer of his unit recommended Sabil for the Medal of Honor. In 1951, he was posthumously given the award, where his citation reads as follows. During an attack on a camouflaged area containing a concentration of enemy troops, artillery, and armored vehicles, Major Sabil's F-51 aircraft was severely damaged by anti-aircraft fire. Although fully cognizant of the short period he could remain airborne, he deliberately ignored the possibility of survival by abandoning the aircraft or crash landing and continued his attack against the enemy forces threatening the security of friendly ground troops. In his determination, to inflict maximum damage upon the enemy, Major Sibyl again exposed himself to the intense fire of enemy gun batteries and dived on the target to his death. The superior leadership, daring, and selfless devotion to duty, which he displayed in the execution of an extremely dangerous mission, were an inspiration to both his subordinates and superiors, and reflect the highest credit upon himself, the U.S. Air Force, and the armed forces of the United Nations. With the branch being recently established in 1947, Louis Sabil would go down as the first official recipient of the Medal of Honor in the United States Air Force. He would leave behind a wife and a 19-month-old son and is buried in Forest Park, Chicago. Comment on what story I should cover next and please consider subscribing.